did. So John 15 this morning, John 15, and, and uh, as we started last week, um, going in a little bit different pattern, so we're going to go through this part of uh, the words of Jesus, the last night of his life, John giving us things that the other guys um, didn't record for us, very significant and very important teaching, so we're, we're going to slow down a little bit, we'll cover part in the morning, and re- wherever we leave off in the morning, we'll pick up again Sunday night, so if Sunday night's not part of your normal program, I'd encourage you to uh, make it, just for the next few weeks at least, something that you say, okay, well, I can go for three weeks or the next four weeks, I'll, I'll come on Sunday night. And let me just, if you're a Giants fan, I know there's a, there's a little game tonight, <laughs> but, but I'm a Red Sox fan and my team won last year, and this is what I did last year, and it's super helpful. I only watched games that the Red Sox won. <laughs> so my memory of last year's playoffs was, it's just this sort of epic run where they never lost. Because uh, I recorded the games, and when they won, I watched them, and I don't want to watch a game that my team didn't win. And uh, so, you know, just record the game, church, you just come to church, record the game, if they win, you know, then you watch it, if they don't win, then you save your, think of all the Tums you won't eat, uh, how nice you'll be to your dog, your dog will be so happy to see you push record, the dog will be, oh, thank God, you know, your wife, the kids will move back home. So anyway, we encourage you to come out. These, these, these words of Jesus, obviously the Bible, we believe in all of it. We believe it's all inspired. We, we believe in the original autographs. It was inerrant. Uh, we think that every word of God is important and uh, is God-breathed and is profitable. But that being said, there are, there are different places in Scripture that are more significant. I don't think there's any doubt about that. There, the Proverbs, we believe they're inspired. There's Proverbs about a work ethic. But the but the passage that talks about the death of Jesus on the cross is more significant. It doesn't mean it's more the word of God. It just has, has a more important place. And so these last words of Jesus to his disciples are very significant. Not that not having a work ethic or any other verse you could find or warning or encouragement in the scripture. You know, they're all, it's all the scripture. It's all the word of God. But coming to these words of Jesus as he's instructing his disciples, we're his disciples. These are words that... You, you can just assume Jesus is speaking directly to you because he is. You're a disciple. He's actually going to pray for you specifically. John 17 is a prayer. Part of the prayer is about them, and then part of the prayer is specifically about you, those that would believe in Jesus because of what they said. He's, he literally pray, prays for us. So this is a very important part of Scripture. And chapter 15 begins with a metaphor. Verse 1, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So we are, we're drawn into a picture of a vineyard, a picture of a vine, a picture of someone taking care of the vine, and then that process. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, that's something that we live in an area where they grow a lot of grapes. And they produce a lot of wine and it's not something that is foreign to us. We actually in our church have, have several farmers who that's their livelihood. So the concept is something that would be understood by them, and for us it would be understood. So here you go. There's seasons that happen in the life of the vineyard. There's a vine dresser, and he tends the vineyard. So you come, and you've got branches. They produce really well, but they don't continually produce. So they come along, and then they, they clean them up, right? They just had the harvest. And you'll see all the kind of the damage that's been done. You'll look at the, the vineyards are going to look a certain way, but then the guys will come in, and then what do they do? They'll, they'll clean it up. That's what Jesus is saying here. I'm the vine. My father's the vine dresser. And he comes in, and he, he tends the vineyard. So there's this metaphor happening. Then he relates it to us. Verse 3, you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So this process taking away branches in a way he says doesn't really apply to you because I've already spoken to you. My word has cleaned you up. Then verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Now he extends the metaphor to us. I'm the vine and you're the branches. He sort of gave us the picture before he spelled it out. You're going to abide in me and that's how That's how the fruit will be produced in you. I'm the vine and you're the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Jesus chooses a a metaphor to sort of explain the things that he's been saying. Jesus is a great teacher. And I don't know if at this point maybe the disciples were not looking like they were understanding what he was saying. Uh, I'll just clue you in. If you ever hear me start telling a story, it might be because someone's glazing over in the audience. Stories are great. People that are they start losing it, you start telling them a story, and they're like, oh yeah, that story, that's... They go back to sleep, you start giving information. Everybody loves a story. Jesus was a master teacher, and he used stories continually. And go through his teaching and see how many times he used some kind of a simile or a metaphor or a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like... The whole chapter on the kingdom of heaven is a whole chapter of stories. It's like a a guy who caught a bunch of fish and net was full and all kinds of fish. Some he wanted, some he didn't want, and he just sorted them all out. And you think, okay, Jesus, what in the world? It's a story. And then he explained the parables to the guys. He's using illustrations. We think in pictures. So he's given some very important information in the previous chapter. This is all happening on the night that he's going to be crucified the the following day the jewish day begins at sundown so it's that day started with the passover meal the washing the disciples feet judas went out they've had communion and then now he begins to speak to them about what's coming and about how they're going to go forward in this new relationship this transition time from having jesus physically present with them to now jesus no longer physically present but that's not that's not to say they don't still have a relationship with him They're going to transition in the way they relate to him. Before they could come up and put their hand on him and say, what do you think we should do? Now if they go to put their hand on him, well, where is he? He's going to be gone. He's going to die on the cross, rise from the dead, appear and demonstrate that he's alive and then ascend into heaven. And the rest of their lives on earth, they're going to live without him physically present. So they're in this transition and teaching them about the transition. He said some very important things. He talked about the works that he would do that he had been doing that they would do. If you look back in verse 12 of chapter 14, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Jesus makes it really clear that the things that you saw him doing, he will still do. He will still teach people about the kingdom of God. He will still bring the information about heaven. He will still teach people about life on earth. He will still teach people what's valuable and what's not valuable. He'll still be healing people. He'll still be setting people free. People who have demons in their life that are tormenting them, he will still set them free. All the things that you saw him do, he's not going to stop doing. But he tells them, you're going to do the things now. Now, they've already been sent out on a short-term trip, at least twice that we know, once a group of 70, and once the 12. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't more, but we only really read about two times. So at least two times, maybe more, but at least twice, they were commissioned where, remember he said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give, whatever house you enter into, stay there, and if if you're, you know, you give them your peace and they receive you, then let your peace remain on the house, and if not, then go out and go on your way. Specific instructions for those short-term trips. They don't apply... Uh, forever, but just because he said, don't take any money. Don't, don't bring any extra clothes. I mean, don't even bring a carry-on. Just the clothes that you're wearing, and, and don't bring two sandals, just, just two pairs. Just go for it. It's a short trip. So they'd already had some experience of him commissioning them, but it's obvious as they're arguing about who's the greatest, their thought of the nature of the kingdom is that he's staying on earth, he's establishing his kingdom on earth, He will be on earth and they will be serving him in some kind of capacities with him as he establishes his control as king, dominating the world. But that's not the nature of the kingdom. They were misunderstanding him. Even after the resurrection in the book of Acts, when they they say, are you at this time restoring the kingdom to Israel? Even now, it's like, well, okay, you're risen from the dark. Now it's going to happen. Remember what he told them? Very significant. It relates to this passage. 
He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set under his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Are you going to make your kingdom right now? Is this now when we get to put on cool robes and, you know, bonk people on the head and rule over them? Remember James and John, we want to sit at your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. Is this when this is going to happen? And Jesus said, that's not what's happening right now. What's going to happen right now is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to receive power like you've never received it and you'll be able to go out into this world, starting right here in Jerusalem where they just killed Jesus, where there's all this animosity against him. Right here in Jerusalem and in the Judea and then even to the Samaritans and then even to the Gentiles. You're going to take the gospel everywhere in the power of the Holy Spirit. Their, their concepts are being upended, and they're having to let go of what they thought was about to happen. That's extremely important to recognize as we try to consider this as it relates to us. Because many times I have a weird concept about what God's wanting to do in my life. And these, these words of Jesus in this section will set me straight. And what Jesus is talking about specifically in chapter 15, this analogy that he uses of branches and vines this connection and life coming, that process is the thing that will keep me straight. It will straighten me out. It will change my life. You see, Jesus was teaching them, listen, I'm going to go, but you're going to stay. And though I'm gone, doesn't mean I'm gone. I'm going to still be here. And everything that you saw me doing, it's still going to happen. So if someone calls you today and they say, hey, I know you go to church. I think there's a demon that lives in my house. Don't just say wrong number, click and hang up on them. You say, well, what would make you think there's a demon in your house? Have you been watching too many scary movies? You've been reading Stephen King books? Hey, get rid of that channel. Stop watching that stuff. Get rid of those. I mean, like, you need to open your heart to the Lord. You start preaching the gospel to him, right? And they say, okay, I want to accept Jesus. But, and, you know, they scream. And there's something happening. I don't know what it is. Something spiritual. Are you afraid? Are you confident that in the name of Jesus, you have authority over all the power of the enemy? Listen, I've had those phone calls. I've had people call me and say, I think my friend's possessed. The first time I got that message, I'd been saved for like a month and a half. And remember my story? I didn't grow up in church. So the idea of demons, all I knew was like spinning heads and pea soup and movie <laughs> stars, you know, or whatever, like whatever you see on TV. I hadn't read enough of the Bible to even know that that was real or even what you would do. I didn't know anything. Someone said, hey, this friend... He's got this serious problem, and I thought they were making fun of me and kind of persecuting me because I was a Christian. And bring them over. You know, I'll talk with them. I share the gospel with them, thinking, I'll, I'll, you know, you want to make fun of me? Well, I'll preach the gospel to you. I'll win. That, I, I'll, I'll make that exchange every day. You make fun of me, and I'll preach the gospel. So we got all done with that, and then the, I said, what's the story with this spirit thing? What, what is that all about? The end, of, end result is the guy got set free power, the power of God. I didn't even know anything about it. How does that happen? Jesus is teaching the guys, you won't see me. I won't physically be there. You won't see my flesh and blood anymore, but don't think for a second that I'm not there. You need to know that everything that you've seen me do, you're going to go out in the world and you don't have to be afraid of this world any more than I've ever been afraid of the world. Remember when you guys were afraid of the storm? Remember when you were afraid of the five loaves and two fish? Remember when you're afraid of the naked guy coming out of the graveyard? out of his mind, possessed. Remember, every time that you were, didn't know how you were going to pay the taxes, they're asking questions you don't know how to answer. Every time I was the solution, don't think that's going to stop, because it's not. I'm going to be gone, but I'm still going to be here. And everything you saw me do, you're going to do. And, he said in verse 12, greater things. He's upending their concept of the kingdom. It's going to be different than what they were thinking. He then talks about prayer. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, we're still in chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. Could I just reiterate that to you? If you ask anything in Jesus' name, he'll do it. You might say, man, I came to the right church. Because <laughs> I've been looking for a God that will do anything that I say. Is that what Jesus is saying? 
He's going he's gonna to repeat this kind of open-ended promise of answered prayer. He's going he's gonna to attach to it God's will that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Like any loving father, there, there's no father that's going to give his son or daughter something that's going to hurt them or destroy them. How many times as a parent your kid wants something and you look at him and you say, no, you're not going to have that. That's not good for you. That's, that would lead to your destruction. That, you wouldn't be able to handle that. You know, you'll grow to a point and I'll give it to you. Or you'll never grow to a point, you should never have that. God's not going to stop being good, but don't for a moment take away from what Jesus said. If you're here today and you need something to happen in your life, could I just invite you on behalf of Jesus? Ask him. But you say, Rich, it's too big. He didn't say, well, except for the things that are too big. The caveat is so that God can be glorified or God's will. The caveat is not, it's too big right? There are things we, we, would, we would say, well, the be- teaching's balanced out by, is it the will of God? Does it glorify God? The, the things that balance it out aren't, not, well, you know, that's big, so don't ask for that. If you're here today, do you need a miracle? Ask God for it. Do you need to see God work in your life in a certain way? Is your heart longing for something? God's put it on your heart from his word, and you're stirred up about it. Ask. Ask and see what God will do. Listen, we had a couple of miracles last week. I don't know uh, the details behind it, but what I heard was that on Monday night for dinner, something happened at the kitchen where everyone was cooking, and only half the lasagna got made. We had 280 people signed up, 270 people show up and register, and half the lasagna showed up at the building, and everybody ate till they were full. How does that happen? Somebody was praying. Lord, please, I don't know what happened. We have half the food. Make these people not hungry. (laughs) Blind them so when they eat air lasagna, they think it's the real thing. I mean, I don't know how it happened. I mean, I saw, I just kept seeing people get plates. The food went everywhere. It went to everyone. Everyone was eating and talking and eating. And the tables kept, you know, and then finally guys are coming back for seconds and eating and there's still food and half of it was gone. Half of it didn't show up. Well, what was that? Now, you may be a skeptic in your ears, so, well, you guys just overplanned. That's what happened. <laughs> hey, be as skeptical as you want. We believe in prayer. We believe that God makes things happen like that. God wants to bless his people. He loves his people. We've seen, we've, we've had more than our fair share. Apparently, we have trouble when it comes to cooking because it's happened in Africa, Mexico, America. Uh, we've had many, many food miracles. If you need a food miracle... We got you. <laughs> Whatever you ask in my name. When he was there, where did they go when they thought they were going to die in the boat? They went and woke Jesus up. They physically grabbed him and shook him and said, Lord, don't you care? We're perishing. Save us. Physically, he got up and rescued them. Now he's saying, listen, that relationship we've had is not changing. What's going to change is you won't see me, but don't think for a second that you can't ask me to calm the storm and that I'll calm it. Don't think for a second that I won't be there for you in the way that I've always been there for you. Don't think that you can't ask for anything in my name. The access to talk directly to God, he's given him that hope. And then the next little section, and this is the the other part that I think is relating to this metaphor, verse 16 of chapter 14, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. Jesus is going to ascend back to heaven. The son will sit at the right hand of his father till he makes his footstools. And the third person of God, the father, the son, and the spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. And while Jesus is saying, physically I will not be here with you anymore, the spirit of truth will come and he will be with you forever. He will never leave you. In the old covenant, David prayed in that, that famous song, Create in me a clean heart, O God, Psalm 51. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, he sings. Why? Well, in the Old Covenant, he had seen the Holy Spirit come upon Saul, and he'd seen the Holy Spirit leave Saul. The Holy Spirit would come upon these characters, and they would would do great exploits. The Holy Spirit would leave. And David said, I don't want you to leave. (laughs) Jesus is saying in the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit, he never leaves. You now have a relationship with God where the Spirit of God living inside of you. Jesus has been outside of you, 
Jesus now says, we will be inside of you. The Father will be in and the Son and the Spirit. God dwelling in man. The new covenant with you always. So the promise of power, the promise of prayer, the promise of the Holy Spirit, these are all theological concepts. These are all realities of the new covenant. Then in chapter 15, now he gives a very simple picture to the guys. He says, look, here's what that looks like. Here's how that happens. Something you can understand. You guys are branches, and I'm the vine. The branches come come off the vine, and the fruit comes off the branches, right? You'll see when they go through and they clean up the vineyards, what's left? The vine and all those little stubs. I don't know the names of all that stuff. I have some grape vines in my backyard, and you can tell by the way I'm talking, they're not too good shape, right? You know, they look kind of, well, you know, the jungle book or something. I don't know. They're kind of wild. The squirrels eat everything, so I'm bitter. I just don't look back there. (laughs) So there's the vine. When it's all pruned up, there's the vine, and and you see all the places where what's going to grow. The branches are going to grow. Where do the grapes come? The grapes don't hang from the vine. They hang from all these branches that grow off of the vine. That's where all the fruit is produced. This is a wonderful analogy. He's taught us, ask anything in my name. You're going to have the same life that I had, the same power, the same works are going to keep happening, even greater. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth is going to live inside of you. Now here's a picture you can understand. If all that's blowing your mind, you're thinking, what are you talking about? Here's what it is. You got a vine and you got branches. The branches stay connected to the vine and fruit comes off the branch. It's a beautiful picture. A wonderfully luscious fruit full of sweetness. It's going to come out of this branch. And if you severed the branch from the vine, the branch could do nothing. The branch can't do anything. The vine is where it's at, man. That vine has to stay healthy. And if it's healthy and it's prosperous, it's going to send its life through these branches. The fruit will be produced. Jesus said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So he takes a metaphor to try to explain these concepts he's trying to get across to them because they're not thinking the same way he's thinking about the kingdom and about what's about to take place. He says that the Father will have a work of cleansing the branches, pruning them. The word literally for prune in verse 2 is cleanse. He said coming through and lift everything up and clean out all the dead branches and all the, all the organic growth that's going to be there would pollute. It's just going to come through and just clean everything out. So the Father's going to have this work. You're connected to me. The Father's going to clean everything up, and this life is going to flow. I'm the vine, he says, and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me will bear much fruit. So if you want to bear fruit for Jesus, what do you need to do? You need to get goal-oriented, man. You need to be goal-oriented. You need to plan. You need to strive. You need to work hard. You need to identify what the, goal, the main goals, the long-term goals, then you get your short-term goals. That's how you bear fruit for Jesus. It isn't. Not that there's something wrong with goal setting. But if you live in a goal setting society and you take your striving mentality and you bring it into your Christianity and you start living your Christianity like you live as a heathen, then you're going to completely misunderstand what Jesus is getting at. Because fruit comes by abiding. And the word abide is a fantastic word. You know what it means? It means remain. It means stay. It doesn't have any connotation of any action. It's it's one of those words that when you come to this passage, as someone trying to motivate people to action, if I'm a pastor and I look at a church and I say, these people need to be motivated. We need to motivate them to give. We need to motivate them to serve. We need to get these people going. This isn't really a favorable passage. Because the verb that's used here, <laughs> it's like uh, you went to Hawaii, right? Gosh, hang loose. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, chill. He'd say, he, just connect, stay connected. There's no striving, no nothing. What's interesting about our culture, and I think you'd teach this probably differently in different cultures, different, uh, the devil has worked differently in different cultures to create obstacles to receiving this truth because this is one of the most important truths there is because it's how to be fruitful. 
In our culture, what he's done is he's stirred all of us up to be quite driven, to be quite goal-oriented, to, to push and to, to be self-reliant people. And Jesus is teaching something very different than that. He says, you're going to need to pray. How this is going to work is you're going to ask. You ask me anything and I'll do it. He, he says the Holy Spirit is going to come inside you. He talks about the Spirit will remind you of everything. The Holy Spirit will show you all truth. He'll bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. You're going to enter into this relationship. What he's describing here is something very, very relational. Very, very relational. Not really project-oriented. It's not the analogy of a business or a project manager. It's the analogy of someone who's in deep communion, deep relationship with another, using the analogy from farming, of a branch and a vine. And this connection, if the connection is maintained... The life can't help but come out, right? The branches aren't striving to produce fruit. The branches aren't goal-oriented. Now, the vine dresser, when he goes through and he cleans everything up, he might be. The vine dresser might go through and say, this is a three-year-old branch, this is a two-year-old branch, this is a one-year-old branch. Hey, how'd that guy still get here? He's got the tie. He's a five-year-old branch. He, the vine dresser will go through. He might be goal-oriented. He might be thinking a whole bunch of things, but we're not the vine dresser in the story. Who's the vine dresser? God. Who are we in the story? The lamest part of the story. <laughs> the branch that, man, if something, someone comes by and bumps him and he cracks, oh, he's worthless. I mean, you, the branch that unless it's connected, the vine is everything, the vine dresser, he's taking care of it. The vine is where the life is. Now the branch, the branch has got it going on. It gets to be part of the fruit. That's where the fruit comes. And all the branch needs to do is stay connected. That's it. Just stay connected. How do you stay connected? The Spirit of God. Prayer. Power. That fruit that's going to come out is is that power. The life of Jesus becomes my life. It becomes my orientation. He reiterates the the idea of prayer in verse 7 in chapter 15. He says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. He's now connecting the previous teaching, the previous exhortation to pray for anything, and he connects it right into his analogy or his metaphor. Listen, the metaphor that I'm talking to you, Jesus would say, has everything to do with prayer. And he adds there in verse 7 his words. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. He had said we're abiding in him and he's abiding in us. We're in him, he's in us. Now, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, if you're going to expand it, you'd say it includes prayer. It also includes his words. If his words abide in you, now what does that mean? This is how we're fruitful. You can make goals. You can come up with a goal. You can seek the Lord in prayer, and God can give you some vision. You can ask the Lord how to fulfill that. But all of those things are seen in a context of having communion and a relationship with God. The danger that the church has faced and continues to face, and will always face until the Lord comes back, is the idea that we become goal-oriented, and we sever, and we separate ourselves apart from this idea of relationship. And it's very natural for us to do this. We would much rather find our comfort and our solace in some kind of system. We don't like to admit it, but we, human beings are just bent towards becoming institutional and, and having a system and move away from relationship. It's our struggle, especially in our culture. And Jesus is saying, listen, my words have to abide in you. The words of Jesus remaining in me. My daughter was asking for math homework, some subject that I had taught her about last year, and she asked me last night. She said, how do I solve for the limit here? And I looked at it and I thought, I used to know that. (laughs) And it was gone. The chalkboard had been erased. There was no residual chalk on that board. It was like someone hosed it off with a high-pressure washer. There was nothing. And I go, well, did you look in your book? And she's all, yeah. And I said, well, did you look in the other book? Did you Google it? Did you? Don't ask me. I have no recollection. Less than a year ago, we talked about this, but I, it's gone. It's gone. But ask me what, what I read in my Bible this morning. I better be able to tell you, right? 
Where are you reading in your Bible, Rich? What did you read this morning? I'm in the book of Judges. And the Lord's speaking to me. You know, whatever else I forget, you know what I don't want to forget? I don't want to forget the words of Jesus. I don't want to forget what he's saying to me. I want to meditate on him. When, how long? Was it, what does Psalm 1 say about the man? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates two or even three hours a day. What does it say? Psalm 1, you know it. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. A driven man, a goal-oriented man, a proud man, what is he meditating on at night or during the day? He could be a Christian. He could be a pastor. He could be in the ministry. What's, what's the man's mind fixed on? The man abiding in Jesus He's meditating on something. He's giving himself to something. He's in a relationship with someone, and that's he's kind of fixated on that. He may not remember how to take the limit. I even remember. I remember the problem because I'm bitter. I got to figure it out this afternoon before tonight because I, I did think about it all night. I was trying to prepare for my study, but it's in my head. If you know calculus really good, talk to me after the service, and I can have it off my mind for second service. You, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you desire, it will be done for you. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about someone who is in such a relationship with him and is listening to him so carefully that this person is so in tune with his mind that they would ask whatever they want and God would do it. Do you know anybody like that? Don't you want to be that? Listen, Christianity is not going to church. It's not reading your Bible. Those are two important things, right? They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. These are all components. These are all things that are very important. But what's the analogy? What's the metaphor? What's the picture? The picture is life in Jesus. And how does that life happen? It happens when a person is connected to Jesus. That, that, that life-giving connection is happening, and the life of Jesus is my life now. That's why Jesus would describe it like this when he said, if you want to be my disciple, whoever wants to come after me and be my disciple, what do you need to do? You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, he said. That's the exchange that happens. It's no longer this self-centered, I've set this up, God's going to do it, this is what I want to have happen. I've given up that old life, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, and now when when it comes down to decision-making, it's deny me, Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to sacrifice. I'm carrying a cross. I say yes to sacrifice. Even if it costs me personally, I'm saying yes to Jesus, no to myself, and yes to Jesus, and then what? Then I'm following him. That exchange has to happen. If that exchange isn't happening, then your Christian life is messed up. You know, you're not abiding. (laughs) There's not going to be fruit. It's not going to be any fruit. Jesus says in verse 8 of chapter 15, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. The Father is going to be glorified when we bear fruit. And how do we bear fruit? Well, not by striving, not by our own effort. It's not by mind, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We've we've entered into a relationship with God. We're abiding in Jesus. And so Jesus says, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to bear much fruit. You're going to bear bear the kind of fruit that my my father would be glorified in. Now, Paul talks about the works of the flesh to the Galatians. They were in danger of of seeking God through legalism. People were coming and giving them a set of rules. You need to be circumcised. You need to follow the law of Moses. You need to eat the right foods. Coming into the Gentile churches and upsetting them with this... uh, twisted gospel, not really a gospel, Paul says. Not good news, it's, it's false. Jesus, it's, it's Jesus, it's grace. And, and then he gets to the end and he says, listen, the works of the flesh, the works of the flesh, and he gives a list. They're, they're sexual, they're lustful, they're prideful, you know, they're, they're all, the, all the expressions of the flesh, those are works of the flesh, but then he says, the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when you're in the flesh, you can have works. The flesh works, and the flesh works hard. And you can get a bunch of people working, 
But listen, that doesn't mean it's going to produce any fruit at all. That won't be fruit. You know what produces fruit? The Holy Spirit. Paul said the fruit of the Spirit, and then he describes the fruit of the Spirit. What's the first word? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. That's the power that will change the world. Because you know what the world needs? Love. You know what the world doesn't have any? It doesn't have any love. You know, in the world, they've got acid. Acid's an amazing, mind-blowing trip. People take acid. They want to try acid. They want to take acid. They want to be in a certain place and take acid. Meth is a very powerful drug. It gets a hold of people's lives. People are selling it by the multiple millions of dollars. I mean, they're, it's such a, an industry for drugs. And you got the whole world is searching for some kind of chemically induced experience. Why? Ultimately, why? You can answer it. It's not oversimplifying the problem. You know why? Love. You know what the heart's longing for? Love. The heart longs to be in a relationship of love. Human beings are made to have a relationship with God and experience the love of God. And until, they're, until they've had that, they're going to they're be so lost and so empty. And if you won't accept that, then you're going to look everywhere else for it. And Satan has created a world system, a whole, a whole carnival of events to get you ripped off. And if it's not one thing, it'll be the other. And if it's not that, it'll be this thing. And if it's not drugs, it'll be an ex- some other experience. If it's not a relationship, it'll be this other thing. But love. When you're in this relationship that Jesus is talking about, the Father is going to be glorified, revealed, seen, recognized. How will people recognize it? They're going to see love. And how are they going to see love if I don't deny myself? <laughs> they'll see me. And they'll say, I don't want anything that you have. But if I'm denying myself and I take up my cross and I make my heart open to sacrifice and I'm in this connected relationship with Jesus and his life is flowing in me and and his words are in me and I'm listening to what he says, then he's going to inspire me from the inside and with the spirit living inside of me and then his power inside of me. And then what's it going to be produced? Love. It'll be love. Isn't that amazing to think about? It's impossible. It's impossible. It's a wonderful miracle. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so you'll be my disciples. These are the disciples of Jesus. We're made to produce fruit, but the fruit comes simply by abiding in Jesus. So how do you abide in Jesus? I hesitate to even give you a whole list of things to do because if you're like me, you'll start striving. It doesn't take much to get me striving. I was born, I came out of the world striving. I kind of relate to Jacob when he's holding his brother, you know, the twins that were born in the Old Testament. The one guy comes out and the other dude's got him by the leg. That guy was a striver, wasn't he? Striving all the way through until when? Until God finally broke him. Broke his hip. Dislocated his hip and he walked the rest of his life with a reminder, I'm governed by God. But it was after a long fight. (laughs) He fought God all night. Now, can you imagine fighting some angel all night and not giving up? You can't tap me out. And the angel's working him with every kind of angelic jujitsu. I mean, you know, think of what what kind of Muay Thai do angels know? He was getting whooped. Don't think of Jacob as being this scrapper that like almost like, I'm not giving up. (laughs) Have you had enough? He was getting, he was just getting rolled around. (laughs) He wouldn't quit. He wouldn't, he would, he was so stubborn so stubborn, so hard-headed. And finally, you know, remember what happened? You know how the story ends. You guys know the story. But finally, the angel dislocates his hip and says, fine, and is leaving. And then Jacob now, his grip changes. He grabs him and he says, you can't leave me. <laughs> Don't leave me. You can't leave me until you bless me. Now he's humbled. And what the blessing was a name change. Your name is Jacob, which means striver, catching someone by the heel. But your, ne- your new name is going to be Israel. That's where the name Israel comes from, by the way. Your new name is Israel, which means prince of God. Or, or you could take it literally and say governed by God. Mastered by God. You were the man that no one could master. And now you're, now you're mastered by God. You're a prince of God. Governed by God. A name change. You see, Jesus is talking about something that God's always been doing in people's lives. This isn't something different or new. It's just the fulfillment of it. This is what everything was pointing to. Jesus now saying, here's how this will work. So how do you abide? Just take the things Jesus has been talking about. How do you abide? You pray. You pray. How do you abide? 
You open your heart to the Spirit, and you say, Spirit, what do you want to do today? Spirit, how do you want to handle this? Lord, you're inside of me. What do you want to do about this? You just walk in in perpetual and continual fellowship with God. You don't have to strive for that to happen. You just surrender to it, and you recognize it, and, and you'll find God speaking to you. You're in a situation that's way beyond what you're able to do. I was talking with Brandon, who, who smoked all the ribs you know, uh, for the meal last week, and I saw him in the morning. I go, how's it going? He goes, it could be a little warmer out here. <laughs> like, I'm hoping that it will get done, but it could be warmer. All right, well, we'll pray. You know, you're, you're cooking food, but when you're cooking food and you're cooking food with Jesus, you're in fellowship with Jesus, aren't you? Now, you might say, I'm not. I just throw it down there, man. I know how to cook. Okay, well, that's you. Live that way. But if you're going to be involved in things that are going to bring glory to God, you're going to have to walk in fellowship with God because they're going to be way beyond your pay grade. If you're going to walk in things that are going to bring glory to God, if you're going to walk in things that are going to produce that kind of fruit, then you're going to walk in fellowship. You're going to say, Lord, is this really your idea? Because I don't think we can afford this. I don't think I have the time for this. I don't think I have the energy for this. I sure don't have the gifts to do this. I don't know how this would happen. And the Spirit's prompting you and he's telling you, you need to do this. You need to do this. And that, that's the abiding. It's the surrender. The Spirit inside of you. And he's telling you what to do and you surrender to it. And then you step out into it in fellowship. Walking with the Lord. Praying and talking with him. Turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul, at the end of this little letter, kind of gives us a little quick... Uh, I think it's, a, it's like a window opening into what the new covenant looks like, this whole idea of abiding. Here's what abiding looks like, real simple phrases. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18. And there's a repetition in the three statements, and the repetition is the concept of always. Okay, Three different verbs, but each one is connected with a... This isn't a sometimes thing, it's an always thing. So verse 16, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What's God's will for your life? I think that this, you could take this passage and you could superimpose it back over the abiding passage. What's God's will for you in Christ Jesus? Well, how in the world am I going to rejoice always unless I'm abiding in Jesus? Because my day doesn't go the way that I want it. If my day was going the way that I want, want it, my, my night would have been way longer. I'd still be asleep right now. I don't usually set an alarm, and I woke up without my alarm, and I looked at my alarm, and I said, well, this is when I wanted to wake up, but something's wrong with this morning. My body is not agreeing with me. And what's with these days? They're getting shorter, and it's dark outside still, and... You know, I closed my eyes and I was like, Lord, can't we just, you know, like in Joshua's day, the day got longer, like just make the sleep part longer. Sleep for like six more hours and then have it be, you know, this time. You know, you don't get to have the day go the way you want it. How in the world are you going to go through your day rejoicing always? How do you do that? Well, you'd have to see your day through the lens of what's Jesus doing, right? You'd have to... You'd have to have a transformation of the way that, for me, I'd have to have a transformation of the way that I think so that when I looked at everything, I'd see it differently. Because it's not hard for me to see things as obstacles to what I want to do. For example, someone driving in front of me, like the person this morning trying to drive to church, and they didn't come into our parking lot. So I know that you're not here, but you may be listening I don't know what the person was doing. It's like 15 miles an hour through my neighborhood. I'm on his tail. Like, come on, don't you know I'm a pastor? I'm on my way to church. <laughs> trying to be in the spirit, and you're making me in the flesh. <laughs> the Lord's like, what are you in such a hurry for? I'm not in a hurry. I wasn't in a hurry. This guy's going so slow. Really? Is this how you want to be today? Apparently, it is. <laughs> it's how I am. This really, this is what you want to do today? I was sitting in the office when I first got in, and a little guy came by, one of the uh, little guys in the church. I had my iPad out. I was kind of 
drawing some pictures of my thoughts, you know, kind of like making a mind map with my, uh, on my iPad. And he looks at my thing and he goes, hey, you know what this, you can do with this thing? And he pushes his finger on the thing and he pushes this color button and he erased all of the things I had done. <laughs> Completely erased everything I'd spent the last 25 minutes doing. And I go, oh yeah, that works cool, buddy. <laughs> Rejoice always. Are you kidding? <laughs> kind of a stupid Bible verse is this. <laughs> Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, you already have, I already told you all this stuff. You know the stuff that you're going to say. You know what I put on your heart. You know what I want to say to everybody. You know how simple this is. This isn't complicated. You have no, I have no new earth shattering secret. There's no secret of fruit bearing. It is the most simple the most basic concept of all. You know what it is? It's just stick with Jesus. And the only way that I know to rejoice always is to stick with Jesus. The only way this could ever happen is if I'm looking every, at everything through the lens of, well, what, what are you doing, Lord? Well, what are you doing? Because I thought we were doing this. You know, the disciples in this context in which we're reading in John 15 they could say, Lord, what are you talking about? You're going to establish your kingdom. We're going to be your guys. We're going to rule. We're going to get rid of the Romans. Yeah, that's not what we're doing, fellas. You're going to need to switch gears here, and you need to come alongside. And the only way this is going to work is if you abide in me, because branches separated from the vine, they don't do anything. They're dead. You guys, the only way you're going to have any life is you've got to stay connected to me. And to stay connected to Jesus, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. You've got to follow me, Jesus said. Rejoice always. The only way you could do that is to be able to see, say, all right, Lord, this is what you're doing. What, how are we going to do this then? How is this going to happen? This is going to require a miracle. I don't know what you're going to do. Pray without ceasing, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. I think prayer is the, the most neglected thing in the church. It's always been the most neglected thing in the church, not just for us, but for everybody. And the reason why is it's the most powerful thing we have. It's the thing Jesus talks about repeatedly in chapter 14, 15, 16, and then all of 17, he prays. He's, it's the example of it. Pray, 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 he says. That's, that's what it means to abide in Jesus. So what do you think the devil is going to try to stop us more than anything else? Why is it that when we started the men's prayer thing a year and a half ago, we have 40 guys show up? Now we're down to the, the 12 apostles. No, you know, it drops down. Why? Well, that's hard to maintain. It's hard to sustain. Prayer requires faith. Prayer requires some discipline. It's hard. Saturday morning prayer meeting, least attended meeting in the church. Always has been the least attended meeting. What's the most important meeting in the church? The prayer meeting. Least attended. The prayer meeting. Why? Satan hates it. It doesn't matter when we've ever had it. It's always the least attended. Paul says, pray without ceasing. How, how, what does he mean, pray without ceasing? He's talking about abiding, I think. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. You're going through your day, you're abiding in Jesus, you pray all the time. Like Nehemiah, we just covered the book of Nehemiah. He's praying, he's praying, he's praying. Some of them are quick prayers. Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, you know. Lord, deliver us. They're quick. He's walking in fellowship. Paul's describing the abiding life. It's Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. The last one, verse 18, in this little triplet. In everything, give thanks. That's, a, that's an orientation, isn't it? Thank you for erasing my notes, little man. Thank you, minivan driver, for driving 15 miles an hour in front of me and making me miss the light that takes three minutes to turn green. <laughs> right, Tim? At Babson, you get the same bitterness. He's, you know the one I'm talking about. I hate that light. You miss it, you're stuck there, and the guy's right there, like, this guy. <laughs> and everything give thanks. How in the world, how, how are these everything's attached to joyfulness and prayer and thanksgiving if I'm not abiding? How else would you do this? If this is a law that you have to follow, how in the world are you going to go out of church and not be guilty all day? Oh, that's right, i got to be thankful always. Okay, thankful, thankful, thankful. I hate that person. I'm thankful, <laughs> thankful, thankful. <laughs> You'll never do it. It's impossible. You could never do it. The only way these things could ever happen is what Jesus said, this metaphor that he uses. I'm the vine. My father's in charge of the whole operation. He takes care of stuff. He cleans things up. He, he's the one who makes it go the way he wants it to go. You guys are the branches. 
I'm the vine, and if you stay connected to me, then you're going to bear so much fruit that people will have to say, that was God. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. We need to abide in Jesus. It's that simple. By this is my Father glorified that you'd bear much fruit, and so you'll be my disciples. We had a great example this week. Our, our fellowship, you guys, got to bless the leaders from Calvary Chapel, from all over northern Nevada and northern California, from as far as the border, Smith River, all the way down Monterey, the coastal, all those coastal communities, those guys were here, all through the valley, the guys were here, the foothill guys who probably all had guns, so it's good that you were nice to them. You know, their guys are packing up there. They rarely come down to civilization, but they, they will periodically. The guy, Winnemucca was in the house, um, Dayton Valley, Gardnerville, Nevada, all these guys and elders and young people from all over the place. And you know what the consensus report was? The love of the people that were here ministering to them. That was the thing that struck everybody the most. What, what, what would you call that? Do you, have a, do you have words that you could use based upon the passage we're studying this week that would, just, that would describe what was happening? Well, yeah. What that was was love. That thing that was so sweet to you, that was love. And doesn't that make you glorify your Father in heaven? And you know how that happened in these people's lives? Because they're broken vessels. They're broken vessels. They're like their pastor. <laughs> they're broken vessels. But you know what? Jesus loves broken vessels. He loves broken people. And if any human being would just stay connected to Jesus, you know what will happen in their life? They'll rejoice always. They'll pray without ceasing. They'll be thankful in every situation. Why? Because they've got a different orientation of their life. They're denying themselves. They're taking up their cross. They're following Jesus. And the things that Jesus said, whatever they ask for, they get. These are people that pray. Whatever they ask for, they found out that God wants to be glorified, and they pray boldly. What else? The spirit of truth is inside of them. The works that Jesus did, they're going to be doing. And even greater than that, they'll do, because he goes to the Father. And how will it happen? Who can take credit? No one can take any credit. You say, ma'am, all we did was just hang loose, man. We just hung, we just, we stayed with Jesus. We stayed connected in the life. What you saw, that's Jesus. That's the life of Jesus. So I just would encourage you, let's never get far away from this. So possible. Mary and Martha, Martha, cumbered and burdened by her much serving, bitter at Mary, mad at Jesus, yells at Jesus that Jesus should get Mary to start working. You think of the church in, of, of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Hardworking, persevering, loves good doctrine. And Jesus said, however, I have something against you. You've left your first love. You can have all the things and you're missing the one thing. So don't miss the one thing. That's, that's it. Abide in Jesus. So Lord, we pray for help. We thank you, God, for your patient continuance with us and your love for us. Lord, together as a church family, we thank you for enabling us to be a blessing. Lord, so many, almost really everything we tried to do this last week was something we'd never done before and weren't even sure it would work. And maybe they were all bad ideas and <laughs> maybe they wouldn't have worked, but Lord, you made everything work and, and you blessed everybody and you let everybody experience you. And for that, we are grateful, Lord. We're so blessed to be able to serve you. And we're so glad to not have to strive. That we don't have to strive, we can abide in Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and making such a relationship possible that when we think of Mormon young men at 18 years old required, if they want to measure up, if they want to attain, they're going to have to put on the suit, they're going to have to get the bike, they're going to have to go for two years, be devoted to that thing. And once they've done it, they can check the box. They can take credit. They can say, hey, I did this, and now I've earned this. We think of so many uh, Jehovah's Witnesses um, on a Saturday going out door to door, compelled, driven, counting the days that they've gone and, and wanting to measure up to a standard, and then looking at the others and saying, I'm better, I do more. Lord, we just want to tell you we are so thankful to be free, to be free from all that self-righteousness and pride, to be able to be completely humble and honest before you, to confess our sins to our great high priest and know that he's faithful and righteous to forgive us those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We're so thankful for the grace that's been poured out upon us through your love. And God, we're so blessed by this relationship that you've invented, Lord, that like a vine and like branches, you've made it so that we could understand what Jesus is talking about. Ask me anything. I'll do it. The works that I did, you'll do, and you'll do even greater works. The Spirit will be living inside of you. It'll be like a vine and like branches. Life coming out of the branch that no one could have imagined just because it's connected to the vine. And so, Lord, we say yes. It means so much to each one of us and so diverse, so many diverse ways. But we say yes. Give you a corporate yes, Lord. Do it in my life. Do it, Lord, in each of our lives. Do it in us corporately. We can't think of anything we'd rather do than stay connected to Jesus and have your life come through us. And Lord, that people would experience your love. That you would do it, Lord, and keep us in this place. Protect us, guard us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.